I'm going to start with a passage from the classic science fiction novel Dune. A character named Kynes is talking about building an ecosystem from scratch on a barren desert planet. As I read this passage, think of the word ecosystem as analogous to city building. The thing the ecologically illiterate don't realize about an ecosystem is that it's a system. A system. A system maintains a certain fluid stability that can be destroyed by a misstep in just one niche. A system has order, a flowing from point to point. If something dams that flow, order collapses. The untrained might miss that collapse until it was too late. That's why the highest function of ecology is the understanding of consequences. The highest function is understanding consequences. In a way, he's talking about seeing the forest and the trees and the bugs and bunnies and geology and climate, how they all interrelate. But what if instead of ecosystem, we were talking about city building? So now we're talking about seeing the people and the sidewalks, the roads, the buildings, utilities, the schools, open space, parks, the list goes on. Each of us may only have expertise or professional interest in one of these niches. I'm an engineer. Many of you may be planners, landscape architects, scientists. No one of us can be all seeing. No one area of expertise is omnicompetent when it comes to either running or building a city. No expertise is omnicompetent. We're good at everything. What I'd like to accomplish in this presentation is to promote awareness of the complexity we're all working in when we're filling our individual roles in city building. And I'll give you some tools, some ways of thinking that can make you more effective. To that end, the three concepts I'm going to introduce you to include the law of unintended consequences, complex adaptive systems, and systems thinking. I know those phrases are very academic sounding, but I promise they will make more sense as we go along. So let's start with a story. In rural India, there are cobras. For many years, India was under British colonial rule. One day, a British fellow thought of an idea for reducing the number of cobras. He created a bounty system whereby folks were paid by the cobra for each dead cobra they brought in. This worked for a while, but eventually people figured out it was much easier and profitable to bring in dead cobras they had bred and raised rather than trying to find them in the wild. I mean, who wants to do that? That's dangerous. The British authorities caught on to this and ended the bounty program. This was not what they intended. So what did all of the cobra breeders do with the leftover cobras? Well, they let them loose in the wild, of course, which led to there being more cobras than when they started the bounty system. Thus was born the phrase cobra effect or law of unintended consequences, stemming from an attempt to solve a problem, but in the process actually making it worse. Making it worse, ouch. How does this relate to running or building a city? There can be unintended consequences that result from our land use and infrastructure decisions. These decisions are generally intended to make our communities better, but they can actually make our communities worse off if we're too short-sighted or too narrow in our thinking. I've basically made a 20-year career out of building capital improvement projects to mitigate for land use decisions and to address failing infrastructure. Like this project along Wonderland Creek in Boulder, took 10 years, cost $30 million. Or this project along the Hoffman Drainage Way in Adams County, took 20 years, cost $8 million. Or this retrofit storm drain in Brighton, 15 years, $10 million, to stick a pipe in the ground and bury it. Mitigation projects are messy and expensive in every way you can imagine. An example of the Cobra effect in the public right-of-way. Developers may pay to install public infrastructure, but the local governments generally inherit it. Think about all the pavement, water lines, sewer lines, parks, the list goes on. The same thing goes for projects that are funded by the feds. They may help local governments pay for building major infrastructure, but they aren't around to help maintain it. I'm not personally aware of any federal grants for infrastructure maintenance. 
our cities often develop in ways that are really inefficient from a long-term maintenance standpoint. So when all of that shiny new infrastructure falls apart, there may not be enough local government funding to repair it, or in some cases, replace it. Taxes generated from certain types of land use may not create enough revenue for the local community to someday pay for replacing the infrastructure supporting that land use. Perhaps a community does take in some additional taxes from new development, maybe there are even impact fees. But what if those funding inputs aren't enough to pay for the deferred maintenance or replacements, the costs? Kind of looks like credit card debt, doesn't it? In many ways it is because the cost of maintenance and replacement goes up over time, kind of like paying interest on your credit card debt. A specific example of this happened in Omaha, Nebraska, where the city inherited a number of developer-constructed roads, some of which were substandard. The city eventually ran into a shortage of funds for their citywide pavement maintenance program. In some locations, the city was forced to pulverize failing roads, essentially converting them into dirt roads. Not a popular outcome for residents like this fellow. He picked the wrong day to wear white sneakers. The more structural a piece of infrastructure is, the more expensive it will be to someday replace. In Denver, a glaring example is the Central 70 project. Several miles of I-70 were built as a viaduct back in the 1960s. They must not have had the land to do anything simpler or less structural at the time. It goes through a tight residential, commercial, and industrial corridor. Now we have a massive project to reconstruct this entire section of interstate to lower it widen it, and place a lid over the top of sections of it. This has evolved into a one billion, with a B, dollar project, and it's very political. While we could argue the merits of a project that has demolished many homes and businesses, what can't be argued is the old viaduct was in disrepair and needed replacement. It only lasted around 50 years, and its condition is way past being an issue of maintenance. It's now another capital project on the same stretch of road because of prior land use and inf infrastructure decisions that led to this outcome. How do we avoid outcomes like these, whether it's with transportation or some other niche within building or running a city? Well, let's start with a concept called complex adaptive systems. A complex adaptive system results from a bunch of independent agents operating on simple rules. The collective dynamics among the agents cause the global behavior or outcomes of the system to emerge. The agents in the system don't just interact with each other, they also continually adapt to their environment. So what the heck does that mean? This is one of those things that's easier to show you than tell you. Here are some examples of complex adaptive systems. They could be flocks of birds, schools of fish, ant colonies, pedestrians in a shopping mall, auto traffic, air traffic. Let's consider the flock of birds example. Here you have a flock of thousands of starlings creating these amazing patterns in the sky. Many think, well, there must be a bird that's the leader that everyone is following. Not true. Each bird is completely independent of the bird next to them. They're all just following the same set of rules. These rules are, Stay together, don't crash into each other, and avoid predators and obstacles. Here you can see a predator coming at them. The shape of the flock is the outcome. It doesn't stem from any one individual, but the behavior of the entire flock. It's a complex system of individuals interacting with each other and adapting to their surroundings. The patterns you see emerge from the system's rules and the environment, even though it may seem chaotic. That's where the idea of systems thinking comes in. It is a tool, a way of thinking that can help us navigate complexity and improve our outcomes to find order in the chaos. Like creative thinking or linear thinking, systems is an adjective describing a way of thinking. Not to be confused with thinking about a system where the word system is a noun, like healthcare system or banking system. Systems thinking, as I'm referring to it, is a way of thinking or philosophy. There are about a hundred different definitions for this, so I'll share the way I've come to understand it. Systems thinking is a vantage point from which you see a whole. 
a web of relationships and interconnectedness, rather than focusing only on the specific detail of any particular piece. Referring back to the flock of birds example, a researcher used systems thinking to figure out the simple rules that produced the patterns we see. They found the simplicity underlying the complexity. Instead of focusing only on a single bird, they looked at the web of relationships and interconnectedness among the birds and their environment. Similarly, we notice and understand traffic patterns differently when we zoom out from the street level to the intersection level to a regional level. In a way, systems thinking is like attempting to understand or at least have an awareness of the forest and the trees and the bugs and bunnies and geology and climate. Systems thinking doesn't just relate to having a broader spatial awareness. It's not just about relationships we can see today. It's also about having a broader awareness of time. With systems thinking, we're also trying to see events in the larger context of a pattern that is unfolding over time, much like how we're able to view patterns of land development unfolding over time in this graphic. These land patterns are the outcome of the rules governing this system. This is way more complicated than the flock of birds. We've got economics, land use code, zoning, planning, and of course, many more. Systems thinking is why here in Denver, we map floodplains using future land use conditions. Because we know that developing land will increase runoff and we don't want to remap floodplains every time a new greenfield parcel develops. So systems thinking is a way to think more broadly and more long term about the problems we're trying to solve and the outcomes we're trying to achieve because land use and major infrastructure decisions tend to be pretty permanent. Our decisions will outlast us. The outcomes will be handed down to our professional successors. So what are some ways to be a better systems thinker? Well, one way is to seek feedback and adjust. With the complexity we're all working in, we can't always predict how well our beautiful strategies will actually work. It's like the flock of birds. You can't predict exactly how it will look from one second to the next. That's why it's important to seek feedback and course correct. Let's take homelessness as an example. This is about as complex as problems get. Homeless camps often pop up in the right of way. Eventually, they get shut down and the site cleaned up. People are forced to move on. But the camps often reestablish across some jurisdictional boundary along the same corridor. Homelessness is an outcome of our systems of economics, social services, mental health, education, housing, drug prevention, and at times, criminal justice. It can even involve flood safety when camps set up along waterways. So our feedback tells us that camps move down the street and set back up after we've cleaned them up. Feedback tells us this strategy doesn't seem to reduce homelessness. It seems to move the problem. Not to say we shouldn't keep folks from living in the public right of way, but what are the series of steps in these people's lives that leads to the outcome of them living in a tent? Are there other solutions we could try? There has to be somewhere upstream of that outcome where we can make the most impact? These are the questions we should be asking. Mental models are another area where we should seek feedback and adjust. Mental models are the assumptions, generalizations, and other filters that underline how we interpret a system or situation. Our interpretation helps shape our response or action. So if I say the word dog, most of you will have an idea, a feeling, or a picture that enters your brain. That's your mental model of a dog. Most of you probably have a positive mental model. When I think of a dog, I think of Rosie, our new puppy. The feedback from being around her forms my mental model of dogs being a cute, fun family member who is also a pain in the butt sometimes. So my behavior towards Rosie is loving, playful, sometimes stern. Conversely, I have a friend who hates dogs the opposite of my mental model, but the feedback loop in her life has reinforced hating dogs. She grew up in a tough neighborhood with lots of guard dogs she had to walk past to get to school. So she doesn't think of Rosie, she thinks of this dog. Her mental model is all dogs are mean and will try to bite you. 
So her behavior towards dogs is one of fear. When she acts scared around a dog, it may act scared or fearful back, and that feedback reinforces her fear of dogs, even when she's no longer around guard dogs in the old neighborhood. Here's an example of mental models coming into play in my work. I occasionally interact with open space advisory boards about flood control projects. Some open space professionals, when they hear the term flood control, this is their mental model. I can't say I blame them. Engineers like me built this. But here is a side-by-side -side contrast of this same creek on the same day within a half mile showing how much different we build flood control today. The mental model of the imagery on the left explains why some communities don't allow new developments to count any of the floodplain towards their open space credit. That doesn't look like open space, I get it. But clearly, our modern design approach on the right can be an asset to open space. Here, we're making infrastructure that looks like nature, and what's better for open space than a healthy flowing stream, especially in the middle of a city? So it's a problem when a developer can't count any of this wider floodplain on the right towards their open space credit. It makes them resistant to a natural design approach because it takes more space. They lose lots. So here we have code based on an outdated mental model, and this is why it's important to think beyond your own expertise or department. If you want to be an effective systems thinker, then you must embrace inclusion. If you only know about one little niche of a larger, more complex system, then it stands to reason you'll achieve better outcomes if you recruit people from other niches. Let's say this is a city government. You've got parks, public works, planning, police, social services, finance, legal. That's quite a variety. In the previous example I shared about open space, if development code is being updated, then it needs to be an inclusive process. But inclusion works both ways. For engineers like me who don't typically dabble with writing land use code, if an opportunity to participate comes up, then I need to pony up and help for the area that I understand. The higher the stakes of your project, the more impactful it will be, the more inclusion you need to plan on having. But inclusion is important in small things too. For example, a planning department for a local community required developers to plant trees in landscape medians. Trees are great, I like trees, but here's what would happen. When they got too large, right-of-way maintenance crews would cut them all down because they interfered with maintenance. This is one of those times where different groups within the city should probably talk. When it comes to medians, do we want beautification or maintenance? Could we maybe pick some smaller trees and have both? I was part of the design team for the Wonderland Creek project I mentioned earlier. One thing I'm happy we did as a design team, we asked maintenance staff who plow snow along the trails for input on the design. This was a brand new stretch of regional trail. How could we adjust the trail, railings, walls to make plowing easier? The changes were a few feet here and there and didn't cost much extra but it created more long-term value because we thought to ask. Asking for design input from maintenance staff is easy to do. It's also easy not to do. It takes intention and forethought. It's not something that's typically required of a project. Somebody has to think to include them. Be the one that suggests it. That's systems thinking. Another good way to be a systems thinker is to consider the full life cycle cost of our infrastructure. One of the services we provide at the Mile High Flood District where I work is long-term maintenance of our urban waterways. We've been around for over 50 years and we've learned a lot about life cycle costs. We get to deal with our own prior infrastructure decisions. I did a financial analysis recently of some sites around the metro area. This gets back to the issue I brought up earlier. I wanted to know, will the revenue generated from the adjacent land use pay to maintain the infrastructure serving it. Let's look at a few examples that attempt to answer this question. Here, we are looking at Lena Gulch upstream of 6th Avenue near Colfax. To allow for more property to be developed, the stream was shoved into this rectangular concrete channel section. Yes, that's a creek you're looking at. The channel was built this way to allow for a few extra commercial buildings. 
I looked into how much this property is worth and with a little math was able to figure out how much funding we collect from this property each year. We get around $400 in revenue from this property each year. I looked at what it would cost to fully replace all of this concrete someday and determined it would take over 17,000 years for us to build up enough funding from this property to pay to replace the channel infrastructure. And no, I am not making that up. Let's look at a couple of other locations. Here, we're at the Maxwell Tributary in the Montbello area of Denver. It's a concrete line channel that sits in the street median and it's quite undersized. The real estate in the watershed directly adjacent to the channel is worth over $200 million, which allows us to collect around $10,000 a year. If we just replace the channel lining and exclude all of the culverts, it would still take over 600 years for us to build up enough funding from this neighborhood to pay for the replacement. In the meantime, we patch it when it breaks and hope it holds together. At this final location along Newland Gulch in Parker, we are in a more open channel, but it's still fairly trapezoidal and with some very large grade control structures. Look how big that structure is next to those houses. The property in the watershed adjacent to the creek is worth over $760 million, allowing us to collect around $38,000 a year. It would still take over 300 years to build up the funding to replace the 25 drop structures in this part of the stream. Will they last us 300 years? Uh, not sure I would bet on it. So we know we're part of a complex system. We want to avoid unintended consequences, and systems thinking can help us avoid them. Let me show you how we've used this approach to evolve urban stream design and where we're headed in the future with systems thinking as our guide. Much of our ability to create longer lasting, more resilient, lower maintenance streams rests on the amount of land we have to work with. This aerial comparison shows how stark the contrast can be. These images were taken from the exact same altitude for streams that convey a similar amount of water. When land use decisions force us to confine our streams, the water flows faster and deeper, putting more stress on the bed and banks. This explains the history of building concrete line channels around the country. The concrete was necessary to withstand the depth and velocity of flow caused by the confinement. Think of how the water speeds up on your garden hose when you stick your thumb over the end. The same principle applies here. You shrink the area, the water moves faster. This sort of design is pretty low maintenance until one day when it's not. Just like with the Central 70 project, when infrastructure like this someday falls apart, it will be really expensive to replace. When we open the banks up a bit, we need less rock and concrete, but in this photo, we're still looking quite structural and it's still prone to failure. On this next one, we're doing a little better. You start to see less structure, more green. This last photo along Westerly Creek is more of the ideal situation where we've given the stream plenty of room and we don't need to import nearly as much rock and concrete. This is an engineered channel that used to sit under the runways of the old Stapleton Airport. Sometimes we don't have the room to do this, but this is the ideal. With space for flood flows to spread out, Resilience is achieved with healthy vegetation instead of a bunch of rock or concrete. And it looks like open space. Here is another photo on the same creek. Here is the exact same view at the height of the 2013 flood. Then the very next day, and back to the first photo, which was actually taken eight months after the flood. There was nothing to fix here, just some debris to clean up. Long-term maintenance here involves weed whackers and trash bags rather than heavy earth-moving equipment. There really isn't anything to fix, so we get to play the role of urban gardeners, a literal picture of resilience. That's how systems thinking has improved our outcomes to date. In the future, we want to influence land use patterns out into the watershed. We don't want to just deal with the increase in runoff all in the receiving stream. We think it could be possible to avoid these expensive stream restoration projects altogether if the land were developed in a way that avoids increasing runoff. 
Old school approaches cut off all of these smaller tributaries, turning them into gray curb and gutter and storm drains. If you shift from a traditional site plan like the one on the left to the dendritic or tree-like one on the right, we could reduce or almost eliminate the increase in runoff caused by development. The dendritic layout infiltrates more stormwater by preserving these smaller first order streams. It reduces runoff and the stream could potentially be left in its natural state. As a flood district, we can like this idea all we want, but we need to seek feedback from our initial pilot projects and be ready to course correct. We need to have a sense of inclusion because changing traditional site planning needs to also work for developers, planners, and even the market for potential home buyers. Will they like this layout? And we need to ponder what this layout means for long-term upkeep and maintenance. Will it age well? This is our attempt to understand future consequences of the decisions we're making today. It's like the idea I started with, how a city is like an ecosystem. I hope you enjoyed learning about unintended consequences, complex adaptive systems, and systems thinking. If you want to read more about the topics I covered, these are two great books to check out. If you want to hear more of what I have to say about other topics, here's where to find me. Thanks for watching.